Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly, the only podcast that lets you explore the universe, even while you're stuck at home. My name's Dan, thank you very much for listening. Uh, This week, we'll learn about some of the most devastating hunters in the ocean. Also, you can hear about a really old painting of a kangaroo, and we'll crack through some of your questions. Uh, Today, they're all about leaves, about the sun, and about why we get dizzy. Uh, Talking of questions, very quickly, uh, you can really help me out with your questions. I'll let you know more in just a sec. First... Uh, let's meet some of our alien friends who are just dying to get back home. This is NNG. NNG's Energy Challenge. G, G, what are you doing? Can't stop, N! I've worked it out! Worked what out? Why are you running around the house? Circuits. I was looking on the Earthlings in Trammer webs and they said if you want electricity, you need some circuits. I see where this is going. Stop running, seriously. I'm just doing circuits. I'll have made enough energy in no time and we'll finally be able to get off this horrible little rock and back to Zog. Stop. Seriously, stop. Stop it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Electricity circuits have nothing to do with running around and doing exercises. To be honest, I didn't feel like I made any energy. Just used my energy up. Gosh, I'm puffed out now. Well, take a breather and come and have a look at electquizzery.com. I'm sure it must explain it all. Welcome to electquizzery.com. Find out more about energy on Earth and post your questions for the Quizler. Right. It says electric circuits are collections of wires and electric components connected together in such a way that electric current can flow through them. They're everywhere, even though you might not notice them. Every electrical appliance you can think of contains an electric circuit. So if there's a light in the circuit, or a motor, or something, then it gets the electricity as it flows around, right? You're getting it. And want to have a guess what happens if there's a break in the circuit? I'm guessing that the circuit won't work. Hey, do all the bits of electricity get spilled? No. If a circuit is broken, electricity won't flow at all. Sometimes breaks in the circuit can be helpful. Think about switches, like light switches. When you click them one way, it breaks the circuit and the light goes off. Switch them the other way and on. All right, all right, stop fiddling. You'll wear it out. Gee... Gee, it's dark. Turn it back on. So what are all these pictures on the website? Lines with shapes on top. Are these pictures of different circuits? That's right. A simple circuit of a light switch will have a line travelling through a square to show the route the electricity takes. The bulb is shown as a circle. The power source is shown with a plus sign where the energy comes from and a minus sign to show where it comes back. They're pretty cool. Shame it's not going to help us get back to song, though. I really thought we'd cracked it. Oh, well, the search continues. Watch out. Looks like we're going to fuse, G. Here it comes. Whoopee! I love a bit of fusion. Here it comes. Woohoo! NNG's Energy Challenge with support from National Grid. Find out more online at funkitslive.com slash energy. Now, we've had some pretty big milestones uh, in the history, the long-running history of the greatest podcast in the universe, the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Uh, There was the time that we had Sir Tim Peake on, an actual astronaut. Also, when we were given the award for the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. Um, Thank you very much for for your well wishes about that. Uh, Now, we're coming up to a big event. Uh, We're about to have our two millionth listen. Two million! Over just a couple of years. Now, we're going to celebrate this big event uh, with a special chock full of your questions. We're going to get a proper science expert on, an absolute genius, to come on and to answer anything sciencey that you want to throw at them. Maybe you want to know about uh, space, about deep, dark space, about black holes, about how black holes suck us in. Maybe you want to hear about the sun, about stars. Maybe you want to dive into the oceans. You want to learn about wildlife. You want to learn about what's going on inside your body. Anything sciencey that is rattling around your brain, let me know what it is. 
as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. And then in, in a few weeks' time, I will ask an absolute bona fide science genius all about them to celebrate our two millionth episode. Uh, so get busy with that if you can over the next week or so. Be quick uh, by leaving us a review over on Apple Podcasts. Uh, now, Elias has, has done that with a question. Uh, he is six years old. He wants to know why trees have leaves. I can answer this one, Elias. Now, trees live and they make energy through something called photosynthesis. You know how you breathe in and out to stay alive? This is what trees do, photosynthesis. They take the light from the sun and with water and carbon dioxide, they turn that into energy. Now, they grow leaves to make sure they get as much of that sunlight as possible. And they grow the leaves big and wide to get even more of it. That's why they grow leaves so thank you for that question, Elias. Uh, also this week, hello to Cleo, who is four years old, uh, who wants to know, why does the sun disappear? I reckon you mean about when you go to sleep, don't you, Cleo? The sun disappears every night because the world is constantly spinning around. It spins round and round and round, and the sun vanishes when the part of the world you are on isn't facing the sun anymore. It normally lasts about 12 hours. It's overnight. And it's why some places have daytime when you're asleep. And then when you wake up, you'll start to see the sun again. It'll rise in the east. It'll go down in the west. And it's fine for animals as well. Some of them even prefer it. They're nocturnal. They come out when it's cooler at night for them to hunt. And their eyes have, are really specially adapted to help them be brilliant at that. Uh, thank you for that, Chloe. Lastly, uh, Mateus and Oscar, who are in Bermuda. Oh, very fancy. In balmy Bermuda, Matthias and Oscar. Thanks so much for getting in touch. You want to know... Uh, why do we get dizzy when we roll down hills? And why doesn't it help to close our eyes? Uh, it's, all, it's because it's all to do with what's in your ears, uh, guys. It's nothing to do with your eyes. It's all in your ears. Inside those, you have a little space which is filled with liquid. Now, there are also hairs there as well. Now, when you move, the liquid brushes the hairs, which lets your brain know how balanced you are. Think of water sloshing around in a bath. If you were on a boat and that was happening, you could tell how sturdy it was, couldn't you? How level you are. Now, when you're rolling down hills or you're spinning around in a circle, the water is constantly going round and round and round a bit like a washing machine. It's sloshing against the hairs and that confuses your brain uh, and it makes you feel really dizzy. Thank you for those questions. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show, leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. Very excited uh, for today's guest. She's written a book, which is, is it's huge. It's kind of gone viral and it opens up so much about what we know uh, with humans and our history and how we've come to be. Her name is Bonnie Twee. Uh, she's the author of Why We Swim. Bonnie, hello. Hello. You're in uh, a beautiful, the Bay Area of America, right around San Francisco. That's right. Listen, so the book is Why We Swim, Bonnie. What made you start looking into humans' relationship with water? You know, I started swimming um, from a very young age, and um, it was largely because my parents were such water people, and they met in a swimming pool in Hong Kong. My father was a lifeguard, my mom was a swimmer, and we, my brother and I just grew up, um, you know, at the beach, in the pool, um, on the swim team. We became lifeguards ourselves, and I just... Um, you know, I've had this lifelong relationship with the water and that changed over time. And I kind of wanted to explore, you know, I've, I've been a, a pool swimmer, I've been an open water, ocean swimmer, lake swimmer, and then now I'm a surfer. And I just wanted to, um, you know, always thought about, it is really weird that us humans, we humans um, have this affinity and desire to be in the water. And yet it's not entirely comfortable. It's not entirely native to us. We, we have to be taught how to swim. So a lot of um, you know, most terrestrial mammals went from birth, you know, you know, like cats and dogs and, um, you know, uh, they can swim. If you throw them in the water, you, um, they know how to swim um, from, from, you know, no one has to, no one has to teach them there. You know, the cat, pa cat parents don't have to teach the kids how to swim and um, for them to know how to do that. But we have to be taught. 
stuff. So we're weird in that. Um, and once we do, once we can learn to survive the water, it is something that we have always been really attracted to, you know, not only because we need the water for survival, but also that it's this funny place where we, it's very, it's dangerous for us if we don't know how to conduct ourselves in it. And yet we're so drawn to it. How did you start off looking into this, Bonnie? So when you were thinking about why you love water and why you love swimming and you're wondering how humans have adapted to it because really we shouldn't have you know you've got thousands of years of history to kind of look through there how do you start knowing where to research you know it was very overwhelming i mean you asked such a great question it is um it was overwhelming to kind of figure out you know this huge topic um I thought, okay, let's go way, way back, right? And then also, let's just tell great stories. So, um, you know, I opened the book with this um, survival story, and everyone loves a survival story, and it's about this Icelandic fisherman named Gudlaugur Fridthorsson. And he um, is famous in Iceland because um, back uh, in 1984, he, um, his boat capsized, and he ended up having to swim uh six kilometers um, over six hours in, you know, 41 degree water. Um, six kilometers. To shore. So six th- kilometers. Yeah. Let me just translate that for like people who might be listening here in the UK. So six kilometers is uh, a pool is 25 meters. So it's four of those uh, times. So it's f- 40 of those <laughs> times it's, um, six. It's like 240. Miles. It's like 240 (laughs) laps of a pool, by the way, in like full ice, in full gear. And, you know, it's very, very, very cold, like freezing. Sorry, Bonnie, carry on. (laughs) (laughs) Freezing, freezing, freezing cold. Um, I think it's something like 3.7 miles, I think something like that. Um, And it's so it's in the middle of the night. Everyone has, you know, in in that temperature water, um, you know, you and I would last maybe 20, 30 minutes max. You know, you die of hypothermia. And he was in that water swimming for six hours. So everyone else in the boat, um, all of his, um, you know, his fishing uh, colleagues, unfortunately, drowned. Um, But he swam and survived. And so he, um, it turned out that he had this um, you know, not only was it an excellent swimmer, but he had this um, biological quirk in his body where he, his fat, his body fat was um, two to three times normal human thickness and um, more solid. And he was kind of more like a seal, <laughs> you know, and they called him in the newspapers, the human seal. And all of, they did all of these um, studies on him. And we're, you know, he was the first person really to, to be known to have this, um, this, a uh, really uh, interesting um, physiological trait that helped him survive. Now, so the title of the book is Why We Swim. Uh, did you ever get close to answering that? So for humans, <laughs> sure. for humans as a massive species, like, why do we swim? So I, of course, first and foremost, right, survival. So I, I kind of divide the book up into these five sections. Um, uh, you know, first and foremost, the reason we swim is for survival. So we swim to, um, you know, kind of, again, thinking all the way back to, uh, you know, our evolutionary past, we swam to get new sources of food. We swam to escape predators. We swam, you know, to explore new lands, you know, to get to new places to, to live. And, um you know, once you can do that, it can become so much more. So then you come to well-being, you know, health and and then community and competition and flow. And so all of these different sections of the book have different stories in them to um, kind of illustrate uh, what our unique human relationship with water is and what draws us to it. So there's all the science about like when you put your body in water, in water, what happens to it, right? So um, is it cold water? Is it hot water? Um, Do you feel, you know, like does your circulation, um, you know, your, your, your brain waves uh, change your everything, your heart rate. um, And it's, It's all kinds of things happen to us and all kinds of things happen to us to make us want to get it and and make it feel good to us, even though we're land animals. Uh, You mentioned something there, flow. This word flow amazes me. It's like the secret key to to happiness, really, isn't it? It's, (laughs) It's if you... If, if you're in the zone, so you can be 
like part uh, kind of experiencing flow no matter what you're doing like if you're i guess right. if you're gaming and you're focusing on your game and and y- y- you're completely just in that world that's flow why is swimming so important with with flow like how how is swimming the key to our happiness sometimes bonnie well you know when you're so into doing something so like you said you could be gaming you could be um running or you could be playing a piece of music um or you know just um drawing a picture and i think that that immersion so that the way we talk about it right immersion flow it's very watery but what if you're you know if you're swimming if you are in the water enjoying um you know your body is enjoying that physically you can get into a state of flow mental flow psychological flow um that kind of mimics the the water right the movement of water wandering thoughts and it um one of the things i mentioned with your brain your brain activity changing is that um when we're around water and listen to it see it scientists have found out that um you know our alpha wave activity increases and that's the part um you know those are the brain waves that are associated with creativity and relaxation and calm and that's the state of our minds that sort of um you know encourages like free thought and uh, making connections and it absolutely makes sense if you think about being in water you know just sort of um going on this kind of autopilot um and then the the quality of the water kind of encouraging that kind of thinking and and there's something really beautiful about that Now very quickly Bonnie uh, uh are you a good swimmer? I'm a pretty decent swimmer. <laughs> so I'm an I'm I'm an okay swimmer. My legs and my my feet tend to go flailing all over the place. I'm really good <laughs> underwater. I'm a fantastic underwater swimmer. But then you know people listening to this you might be thinking of your mates at, at school who are just like awesome swimmers and then you go to uh, the world's greatest so someone like Michael Phelps who's won like mm-hmm. every medal under the sun his his skin is like a shark what have you learned about <laughs> what makes someone a better swimmer than another is there something that all brilliant swimmers share you know what's interesting that is a really great question and um what actually there's been a, a quite a bit of research into the body types of swimmers right and actually one thing that um you know was sort of determined um that was different from like runners like runners of um you know uh like sprinters versus marathoners you know they're different very bit different body types with like different distances and the swimmers um their body types were all like they're you could be a great swimmer and have all different kinds of body types. And so I kind of saw that as this wonderful um you know affirmation of the fact that the water is um it welcomes everyone. You know, it's like an equal opportunity awesomeness that you can get in the water and feel great and do well and be a great swimmer and you just have to learn how to do it and practice. Amazing. Um well the book is brilliant. It's it's why we swim. Uh, Bonnie Sweet, thank you so much for joining us from San Francisco. <laughs> now for this week's Dangerous Dan, we're looking at one of the most brutal creatures in the sea. The Barracuda is a long, lean, mean hunting machine. They are sleek, long, thin. Now you might think that makes them look a little bit weak. You'd be incredibly wrong about that. You don't want to mess with these. It means they can dart through the water at 25 miles an hour, which is kind of how fast a car probably drives down your road. Zips by. Uh, they've got razor sharp teeth. They've got a thick jaw and they are ridiculously aggressive. Now you find them in warmer tropical oceans all around the world, living near the top of coral reefs and sea grasses. Now sometimes they will hunt in a in a school, in a shoal, um a, a vast pack of these deadly creatures out to kill, and they've had time to practice too. The fish has been honing its skills for over 50 million years. And in that time, the barracuda has evolved to be one of the most fearsome master predators of the ocean. It's time to look inside your body now with some of our microbe friends. Yeah. Yeah, big time. We've got microbe friends on this show. This is Benny and Mal. Benny and Mal's body teasers with support from the Nuffield Council on bioethics. Oh, hello again. Now, as Nurse Nanobot loves to point out, my lab can get a bit messy. But what she doesn't realize is there's an awful lot of interesting stuff going on under all that mess. Take Benny and Mal for instance. 
They are microbes. That's single-celled organisms to you and me who live at the bottom of an old test tube. And being single-celled organisms, they are very single-minded. Just have a listen. Benny and Mal never agree on anything. You keep interrupting me. So, lads, what's the hot topic today? Boy, lads, what's the hot topic? Sorry, mate. Well, if Big Mouth would let me finish, it's all about changing the way you look. I'd rather have a big mouth than big ears. Don't be silly. Microbes don't have ears, and name-calling isn't nice. And even if I did have big ears, which I don't, well, maybe I like them big. So you'd still want to keep your big, flappy ears, even if you look really silly. You sure about that? Rude. Who cares what you think? The way I look is up to me. If I think I look good, then I feel happy. And so... OK, I do take your point. How we feel about the way we look is very important. You could argue that it's much more important than what other people think. Well, I'm glad you can see my point of view for once. Refreshing. But sometimes other people's opinions do affect how we feel. What if I made fun of your big ears all the time and everyone on the telly and on the internet only had little ones? You might start wondering if yours were, well... A little different. That's true. Things like that can chip away at your self-confidence. Well, if it did get that bad, maybe I'd see if I could get an operation to make them smaller. Job done. Thanks. But it's not quite as simple as that. Surgeons are brilliantly clever and can certainly change the way people look in all sorts of ways. But operations can be risky and they might hurt. If I was really super miserable with my big ears, then why not? Off with my ears! All right, you fought it through, I can tell. But just because you want an operation, does that mean a surgeon has to do it for you? Of course it does. Their job is to make people better, and the operation would make me feel better. So, get on with it, Doc. Still not that simple, mate. Doctors aren't slaves. They even have a special rule, that is, that they must not do harm. They might think cutting your ears off would harm your body more than it would help your feelings. Now, if I was asking for them to cut off a leg because I wanted to be a pirate, (laughs) then I could see your point. But a simple operation on my flappy old ears shouldn't be too controversial, surely? Probably not. They'd still probably want to have a bit of a chat to make sure you knew all the pros and cons, especially about how you might feel afterwards. Feelings can be complicated, you're not wrong. I suppose just because you think smaller ears or a bigger nose or an extra leg might make you happier, no guarantees, right? Maybe getting rid of your sad feelings needs a different solution. Exactly. And fashions can change and the images we see around us change too. Who's to say big ears won't be super fashionable next year? No doubt about it. With the amazing science and medical experts out there, changing the way we look is often possible. But just because we can doesn't mean we should. It's a brain-busting body bamboozler for sure. Sure is. Catch you next time. Benny and Mal's Body Teasers, with support from the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Benny and Mal. Let's get this week's science in the news. Glaciers in the Getz region of Antarctica are flowing much faster. Experts say the 14 glaciers are being melted by warm seawater. It's not good news. Since 1994, they've lost 315 gigatons of ice, which is the same as 126 million Olympic-sized swimming pools full of water. That's how much has been melted from these glaciers over the last almost 30 years. Also, scientists say a 17,300-year-old painting of a kangaroo is Australia's oldest known rock art. It measures two metres and it's painted on the ceiling of a rock shelter uh, in a part of the country well known for Aboriginal paintings. Now get this, it's aged, was discovered, they worked it out through radiocarbon dating ancient mud wasps nests. Come on, let's find out more about that. Radiocarbon dating agent mud wasps nest. Wasps nest. We'll find out more about that in this show. I think we need to. Uh, and finally, NASA has released stunning videos of its Perseverance rover landing on Mars. It shows the final minutes of last week's hair-raising descent 
As the robot wheels made contact with the ground, it was lowered down with a sky crane, which then flew away. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you very much for listening to the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. Remember, if you've got something sciencey that you want answered by an expert to celebrate our two millionth listen for an extra special episode we'll do, uh, let me know what it is. Leave it as a review over on uh, the Science Weekly's page on Apple Podcasts. While you're on Apple, it's one of the best spaces that you can hear loads of podcasts that we make. You can get them wherever you get them, really. You know, Google, Spotify... Listen on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can find us on your DAB digital radio. Listen at the, on the Fun Kids app uh, and we're at funkidslive.com too. 